It is great. I mean, it's that thing of participating, though, it really does wake you up a bit. I went to uh, the Western Region Cricket Centre with my son and a mate of his from school. And they, you know, they're mad at that cricket at the moment. And you just know you, 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 you come from a long, a long lineage of idiots because we went to the bowling machine and you know, they were fantastic. I went in there and I said, this is what I said, I said, all right, lads, I'll show you what the Spartans were all about. Crank it up. <laughs> and they put it up, both, both of those cylinders at 100, 150. Yeah. Um, we're looking at it, I'm thinking, all right, I'll be all right, come on. I mean, this going, come on, come on, like that. And my son started laughing. And for a split second, that, that moment, yeah. it, 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 this is going to hurt. Yeah. <laughs> and why am I doing this? And I got, broke a rib. It hit me. And I went completely front on. And went like, ah! And my son was in hysterics. He's like, I just went straight onto the ground. And I was writhing like that. And my son goes, is that what the Spartans were about? That <laughs> was insane. It hurts. And what was said, the great thing was I was howling and screaming and swearing. And um, the next ball I got up, I got another one, and I got a Yorker on my foot. And I had sand shoes. I was running, it was like Basil Fawlty running around. And I went into the, went into the, the front office, and there's this guy just sitting there reading the Herald Sun. And I'm going, ah, fuck you, He says, we don't have any ice. <laughs> And I go, oh, yeah, I go, go over to the, to the fridge, and I'm like, oh, fuck it. And he says, the fridge is locked. <laughs> and I said, which was open, that one? So I go over to, and I got two bottles of Powerade, and I stuck them on my yeah. foot. And then he goes, you have to pay for them. <laughs> <laughs> and it is, it's, it's stupid. <laughs> but it's fun, I guess. Yeah. And I mean, fun is a big thing. Yeah. I think that is, I mean, Gideon is obviously a guy who can speak about sport uh, really eloquently and uh, it's envious that he can but he I think all three of us just it's that fun it's the, the engagement you have and what he was saying about the, the volunteer work and, and what sport does put back in the community is true and I, I guess when you talk about Australian sports writing that it's a universal thing that, that, that appallingness of newspaper I mean it's just not in Australia, I mean, I think of all that sort of dreadful tabloid writing in England, and if you've ever read any of the American sports pages, they're dreadful. They have their great papers and their great writers, well, you know, like Gideon's equivalents. But it's, it seems to be everywhere, I think. And, but I mean, Gideon's right when he says sport does sort of have a, a, a terribly important part in all our lives. All of us are affected by it, even if we don't participate, even if we don't like it. It's just to shove down us, you know, our, our, our colons. <laughs> uh, Bernard. Um, yeah, how, how, how important sport is, you know, sports. I mean, I firmly believe it's a fantastic... If a kid can play team sport when, when they're in their team, it's fantastic, because they work out how they'd be a part of a, of a larger group. And, you know, if they can survive that, fantastic. It's a sort of communal thing, you know, we don't have that, that much sort of a structured religion these days. So I guess structured sport, in some way, can, can take that, community, that place in, in the community. That's a, that's a very good point. I was talking to David Maloof this morning, and it's a, it's a, in a way it's a shame that we don't have people like David Maloof and Dorothy Porter doing a panel like this because they're very keen sports fans, and they don't find anything sort of anti-intellectual about the about the fascination of, of watching sport. In fact, Dorothy Porter um, bailed me up yesterday in the in the book signing tent and really wanted a, a detailed description of the Tendulkar hundred that she missed the other night because she was busy doing a talk with David Malouf at the uh, at the Opera House. She said that only David Malouf could tear me away from the experience of watching Session Tendulkar get a hundred. But David was saying this morning that he actually felt that in some ways sport was the only area in Australia where people experienced a kind of a moral education. We don't have sort of civics in Australia. We don't have sort of any training about participation in democracy. But, but there is an expectation in Australia that you will adhere to certain sort of fundamental tenets of fair play. Mm. And they're kind of good preparations for fair play in, in other areas of, 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 your, of your daily experience as an, as an Australian citizen. I mean, what, what, why did I start writing about, about sport? Um, the, first, the first sport piece that I wrote was um, the first cricket piece that I wrote because I was living in England in 1990 and I went to see a, um, a game of county cricket between Lancashire and Surrey at the Oval. 
and it was uh, it was a very dry season in uh, in England that year, and there were a lot of runs being made. And Surrey made six for seven hundred and seventy declared, and Lancashire replied with nine for eight hundred and three. <laughs> so it was a four-day orgy of scoring, and I just loved the fact that it was so ludicrous and so futile and so English at the same time, that, because there were still people at the end of the game sitting there in crowd, about twenty people enjoying this this stupid game of cricket that that mm -hmm. that just seemed to caper on without without any end and I, I, when i when i thought about what i missed in sports writing in the daily papers was that none of it had any sort of sense of of place i mean i always like john and william i always read the paper from back to front but i only ever read it for information i never read it for sort of enjoyment of prose or, or pleasure in literature i found nothing really there to detain me and it seemed at times as though they were describing a sort of a game of sport as something that took place in a hermetically sealed biodome in the Mojave Desert. Uh, there was no sort of sense of place or time or context. It was like this kind of detached world. And, and it's weird, isn't it, that in Australia we have sort of a balkanised newspaper in which there is a sports section, there is a business section, there is a news section, there is a television section. Everything is subdivided. There's no sense of of interrelationship between these different parts of our life. It's, it's kind of ghettoised and it's quarantined from people who don't like sport. People who don't like sport are kind of excluded from, from full citizenship, from kind of full participation in the culture. Uh, and I looked for writers who were doing that in Australia and I just really couldn't find any. I looked, I mean, I looked for a, for a time at, um, at trying to find some sort of sense of kinship with sports historians and sports sociologists, and I couldn't really find it there. Although I actually found John at the, um, I met John that way at, uh, at the uh, Australian Society for Sports History Conference in 1995. And uh, John was actually designated to pick me up from the plane uh, going up there. And amazingly, it took us about five minutes to work out that we were both Geelong supporters. <laughs> Something about sort of that hangdog expression Sad. on our faces, that sense of that sense of an understanding of, of life's sufferings. That within within ten minutes, much like John's conversation with William last night, we were exchanging reminiscences about terrible Geelong games and awful Geelong footballers of the of the 1970s. But I think fundamentally, what what I've tried to to, to bring to sports writing is that I've I've decided that I, you shouldn't just check your brain in at the door, which I think is an approach that most Australian sports writers take. And I try not to spend my, my critical and analytical faculties. I try, I try to speak about sport as though it matters. And the weird thing is that sport doesn't actually matter. Sport doesn't matter very much at all. It's fundamentally trivial. No one's going to, no one's going to live or die as a result of sport. What it's the importance that we give to it is the importance that we choose to imbue it with. And there's something great about that. There's something really exciting and, uh, and engaging about being able to bring to sport the level of significance that, that we choose to bring it. Well, I, I, I agree with that. And I just wanted to say that. <laughs> no, it's true. I completely agree with that. I mean, I think that <laughs> idea of not checking your yeah, brain when you yeah. Because I, I love that. So there's some of great sport fighting. And if, if you're talking about sports journalism, is, is almost as fun as um, actually being at the game or the event that's being written about. And that's what's so lousy about some of the stuff you read. And I, well, I'm not a sports writer. Um, I'm just a guy who's won a couple of logies. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but um, I, I, what I, I try and, when I write about sport, I write about it in the sense of, of it belonging to a community or, 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 or being something that joins people together, I guess, or is it a shared experience? And John said something interesting last night about we're talking banging on about cricket, and we're saying this generation of Australian cricketers are the elite, are the first, they're the first generation that have, that have known nothing else. Mm. And in a way, I always look at sport and I think I, I love it because uh, it, it, in its purest form, you know, the girl that swam 100 metres in the world record time just looked around the corner, or the guy that can kick a football was, a, a, you know, he was an accountant down by the jetty or something like that, you know. They weren't separated, they weren't, they were of us, they weren't these people that were up there, they, they weren't like moral sort of, as, as you were talking about, you know, you know Brendan Tavola sort of, yes, I went too fast through a school, that sort of stuff, they were just of us and they could do something like some of us, I don't know, sort of, uh, good cooks or bad cooks, they weren't in themselves another 
pillar, they, you know, they, they went to another estate, and you sort yeah. of think sometimes, you know, is, that, is that what's happening? Well, they looked like us too. Yeah. Well, you look at no, it's, no, true. it's true. You look at um, you look at Australian um, the the shape of the say the average Australian sportsman in the 1950s and 60s. They looked like a normal Australian because they hadn't been kind of hyper professionalised, mm. and there was still a degree of sort of manual labour in Australian life. So that that bred that begat a certain a, a certain body type. They didn't do specialised sort of weight training or, or 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 endurance building in order to make themselves into elite athletes. They were there fundamentally for their skills, not their athleticism. If you look at Australian, the Australian Olympic team now, it doesn't look anything like us. <laughs> and in some senses, that makes them feel somehow less representative Absolutely. of me. Yeah. They're a representative of the Australian Institute of Sport, but I'm not, I don't feel the same sort of sense of kinship that I felt with an Australian sportsman when I was growing up. It's industrial. Mm, it's yes. become industrial. Although there's nothing industrial about swim coaches. They always seem to be fat Queenslanders, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I did all I could, I did all I could, I did all I could with a boy, and we can't go any further. <laughs> and, William, have you noticed they're all called Mr? Mr, I know. It's not being back Kieran Perkins was still calling Mr King Mr King when he was 31 years old. Oh. <laughs> Just a quick one. If I can break it, William, I was very much take, you know, you're talking there about the, um, you know, the sense of community and whatever. Have you got, have you got um, your, um, the memoir there in front of you? I've got one here, uh, you know, for that, um, that Merv Cook story, because I thought that was a wonderful piece if you wanted to. Oh, yeah? If Merv you wanted Cook. to do it. Merv Cook was a rugby league winger, and, you know, my dad hated him. <laughs> He's just like one of those guys, like one of the Geelong footballers that you would go <laughs> Bloody Jesus, bloody Christ. Wait, why do they play the man? Jesus Christ, oh bloody mighty. You're useless cook. Yeah, cook, oh Christ. Here we bloody go. <laughs> and, uh, and my mum, my mum used to sort of try and... Oh, where's I think it's here. Oh, here we go. Um, <laughs> the other great hero was Bevan Bleakley. Bevan he was fantastic, Bleakley. Bevan Bleakley. Man, he, I, 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 I bumped... This is that thing, this is like, you know, I bumped into, they, they, I, I followed this football team that made grand finals, a little bit like Geelong, you know, and they just lost them. <laughs> Fantastic. It was like, they were like, you know, they were like you know, the Germans, you know, in the, all those war movies. <laughs> we are unbeatable, we're going to beat them, yeah, okay? And then suddenly we missed a conversion, we must have, what happened there, you know? It's like, instead of Rommel, they had Merv Cook, you know? Um, but Bev, Bev, Bev was the fiercest man in rugby league, and the only words I ever heard him speak was a sign on there that Michael Bullies, and I went, you know, I went up to him and I was so frightened. He's got big flaming red hair, and he's looking, he's looking, he's just sort of looking at the freezer, and he's like, something like that. And I poked him with a, I couldn't speak to him, I poked him with a pen. He signed, he sort of, he went, Jesus, your fish fingers are cheap. They are the only words I ever heard one of the toughest men in league. Jesus, your fish fingers are cheap. Anyway, uh, Merv, Merv Cook. Merv copped a lot of flack in our house, always getting the blame for any loss of poor performance. Merv, bloody bleeding cook, Dad would growl. Mum would try and stand up for Merv as if he were some slightly feeble and simple minded member of the family. But my father, well, he does try, Colin. No, for Christ's sake, but my father would have none of it. Why do they play that man? Why? He'd ask each of us in turn, even the dog. But on a one particular day at the Redcliffe Showgrounds, playing for a spot in the finals for the first time in years, Redcliffe was up against the West Panthers. You hear that theme song? A team that boasted three internationals. The odds weren't great. West's attacked the Redcliffe line and spun the ball through their slick backs. Oh, here we go. Here we bloody go, growled my father as Merv jiggled about on his wing. And it seemed inevitable they would score until Merv took destiny and the ball in his hands. Merv, the panicked crab, had snared the intercept and he ran and he ran and he ran. And as he ran, a roar from the crowd seemed to curl with a great surge behind him and Merv rode it like a wave. He was chased by three of the fastest men in the comp, but somehow he managed to outrun them all. And when Warren Orr, an international winger, lined Merv up for the tackle and dived towards him from somewhere deep in his past, Merv summoned a fend to Orr's head <laughs> and he palmed the flashy player away. The showgrounds erupted. Articles of clothing, hot dogs, car keys, cans of drink were thrown into the air. Adults hugged each other. And Dad, like so many others, could do no more than bellow at the dike, Merv Cook! Merv Cook! Merv Fleeting! Bloody Cook! <laughs> And I clapped my hands until they were numb. And on that day, at the age of 10, when I saw so many people so happy, I thought just about anything was possible. And Merv walked back uh, along the sideline, breathing hard, and his hands on his hips and his head lowered. And despite the cheers and the adulation, he didn't look towards the noise. In his moment of triumph, his humility and modesty made what he'd done even more epic. And there was no showboating from Merv. He looked almost embarrassed with the attention. 
And as he walked past me, I was so moved, I had to say something. Well played, Merv Cook. Whether there was a break in the noise, or perhaps I yelled louder than I meant to, I don't know, but I said it, and Merv Cook heard me and looked up. And he looked me square in the eyes for a few moments, and as he passed, he gave a small nod of acknowledgement and then carried on to his back, uh, to, to, to his position deep in the corner of the ground. That was fantastic. It was a great moment. It was, it was fantastic. <laughs> William, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I would say that that passage contains truth. <laughs> Because, and that's why we read sports writing and follow sport, is because that is about competence in the face of incompetence. It's about triumph, which we can all relate to whether we've been rugby league players or not, because we all know incompetence and we all know we aspire to competence. And that's the level at which we relate to it. So there is this layered meaning which exists in sports writing. There is the description of what's happening and the great storytelling that that can bring, but then there is this subtext of meaning. Uh, whether it be cricket or rugby league or whatever. Fish fingers are cheap. That just deserves to be the title of an autobiography, doesn't it? <laughs> you should have seen him. This is yeah. fish, but there's fish, also fish. absurdity in sports. No, and that's, what, that's when Gideon was saying, you, you don't check your brain when you write about it. It's, it's completely homogenised, isn't it? I mean, can you remember Harry Beitzel when he had the cricket? And he, yeah, saw, he, right. he thought he thought you know people understand mid on they don't know mid off so they still and he, and he, he designed that clock. the clock <laughs> and it's gone out ten to three the West Indian lads picked it up. It's like, <laughs> and then, I can remember my father, my father coming back from him and saying there was a bastard. He was, but he got drunk or something because he couldn't tell the time after a while. It was all the clock was all over the place. Fantastic, Harry Potter. But just, just on that idea of truth, I, I was invited to write the introduction to the new AFL history that's coming out to the game section of that, and I thought, how am I going to introduce this five thousand word essay on football? I thought I'll go down to the Brunswick Street Oval, the old Fitzroy football ground, and I'll see what's happening there on a Saturday morning during footy season. Now, getting back to volunteerism and the love of the game, what I saw was just magnificent. It was dads who are now in their 30s and 40s with wobbly knees and sore arms and looking a little bit overweight, with kids teaching them the skills that they had learned themselves 30 years before for no other reason than they just love the game, you know? Now, that's the sort of passing on, passing on, passing on thing that happens in sport. There was a great, there was a great site at um, the, uh, the Sydney Cricket Ground uh, in January 2007, after, after Australia had won the Ashes, you might recall that, uh, that Australia won the game slightly before lunch. So the, the, so the cricket writers were there sort of writing their stories up in the, uh, up in the press gallery um, for, for, the, for the rest of the day. And after a while, um, the catering staff at the SCG, someone had got a plastic bat, someone had got a bin and a ball, and this non-stop game of cricket, I swear, carried on for the rest of the day until about six o'clock. There would have been about 150 people involved over the oh, wow. course of the day, men and women, boys and girls, and somehow it kind of organised itself. Just people would rock up, they'd stand there, they'd field for a bit, then they might get a bit of a bowl, then they'd get a bat, and somehow everyone became involved. And I thought, for as long as Australians can't walk past a spontaneous game of cricket without wanting to get involved, this will be a great cricket nation. My dad, the same. Like, he could not... My dad cannot drive past a cricket ground without stopping to see an over from the opening bowler to see if he's doing a bit. Yeah, yeah. He will sit there and watch it. Can I just say, Williams, Williams, Gideon, Williams, Gideon, Williams can I, we'll have to stop sure. to give the people... Oh, sure. We haven't got six out? <laughs> we're just, we're, we've got a lot more up just, our colon. We've just... <laughs> beautifully put, William. Um, <laughs> and Bernard is the enema to release it. Uh, 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 uh. Thank you.